Mobility is a fundamental part of being independent. When we are free to move, we are able to fully participate in society and anything is possible. Yet the world in which we live is not fully inclusive to millions of people who live with lower limb paralysis and mobility impairment because of inaccessible environments and inadequate technology. We face multiple barriers to mobility. The Mobility Unlimited Challenge supports radical improvements in the mobility and independence of people with lower limb paralysis through smarter assistive technologies. And mobility devices can be life changing, but the pace of innovation is frustratingly slow. And the Mobility Unlimited Challenge aims to change that. With me today, I have two esteemed individuals who are uniquely positioned to speak to mobility devices, and I'm delighted to lead us in a discussion today. So firstly, could you please introduce yourselves and tell us about what you do? I'm Sir Philip Craven, uh, used to be called Phil when I was a wheelchair basketball player, played nearly 200 times for Great Britain. In 2001, I parachuted into the International Paralympic Committee as its president. In 2017, I was invited to my great surprise by the president of Toyota, Akio Toyota, to be a member of the board of Toyota in Japan. Hi there, uh, I'm Gil Pratt. Uh, I'm the chief scientist for Toyota Motor Corporation and also the CEO of Toyota Research Institute. It's a privilege to speak to you both, two perfectly, perfectly positioned people to talk about this fascinating subject about mobility. Um, it's a word that we'll be using a lot. It's the Mo Mobility Unlimited Challenge after all. So I want to start with quite a broad question to you both. I'll come to you first, Sir Philip. What does mobility mean to you? Very simply, it means freedom. It means liberation from possibly being imprisoned in some way in life, which is would be a terrible thing uh, to have to feel. And so if I can't be mobile, and I can't be very quickly mobile, I like moving fast, I don't like moving slow. It's about liberation, it's about freedom, and it's about if you are free, and I love the words that you said, which I think are Toyota words, when we are free to move, we are able to fully participate in society and everything is possible. I, I think a lot about autonomy. Uh, one of the topics that we work on at the Toyota Research Institute is uh, automated cars. And most people think about those as a robotic uh, taxi, a car that's going to drive by itself. But I always think that it's actually not about the autonomy of our vehicles. It's actually about the autonomy of people that uh, people feel wonderful when they are independent, when they can yeah. go where they want to go uh, without having to take the time or rely on someone else or feel somehow that they're a burden to some other person. And this is true for people with disabilities. It is true uh, for uh, people that are getting on in years as, as well. And so a lot of the work that we're doing is basically uh, to build machines that are as simple as possible, that effectively amplify people's abilities to be as autonomous and independent as possible. I love that answer. I think that's so 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 important, isn't it? It's not feeling like a burden. It's feeling like you can participate. Exactly. I mean, so back to you, Sir Philip. From your perspective, as as obviously a board member for Toyota. What are your thoughts around Toyota's commitment to this? You explained earlier that you kind of parachuted in and then you grasped with both hands this opportunity. Why do you think this challenge was so necessary and what do you think about Toyota's commitment to it? Well, I think on mobility, uh, Toyota at the moment is going through a transformation that probably, as our president has said, only happens once every 100 years. So we're moving from being a motor manufacturer, one of the biggest in the world, to be a, a mobility company. So mobility is at the center of everything we do. Toyota truly believes that whatever they produce, whatever they can influence, is for the good of society, to be more mobile mm. and therefore more free. Help everybody. Gil, do you want to jump into that? I can see you nodding enthusiastically. Yes, yes. Um, so... I think one of the more recent things that uh, the president has said to us and that all of us have found really just amazing to take to heart 
is this idea that we're shifting from a mass producer of cars mm -hmm. to this really just amazing idea of a mass producer of happiness. If you have the correctly designed machine working in synergy with a person and the, the design is really, really good and people have truly thought about it from a human-centric point of view, what does the person need to complement them, to be synergistic with them, uh, that as a result, their lives can be much more happy than they were before. And, you know, that's really what our big goal is. Is that core to what you're doing then, is putting the, the end user at the heart of your thinking? Yes, that is exactly right. It's not about the technology. It's about human beings. It's about the user, the person that we're trying to help. And so I think one of the themes that's very, very strong in this particular um, act activity that we're a part of here is this human-centered design point of view, where we're always looking at what does the person actually need. It's, it's a wonderful part of the actual the challenge was was knowing that that had been factored into one of the judging criteria is how much are you co-creating? How much are you using the end user in your process? I mean, as a wheelchair user myself, I, I know I've lived firsthand that transformation that you your, your life has when you get the right assistive device, when you, know, you get that right wheelchair or dare I say exoskeleton, which I've had the privilege of experiencing. So Philip, yeah. As a wheelchair user yourself, would you mind mm. trying to articulate how transformative your, your wheelchair is, the assistive devices in general, and, and perhaps as well, how they've changed in your lifetime? Well, and this was back in the 60s, wheelchair basketball was played in very similar chairs that you'd find in a hospital. And they didn't really move at all. And then uh, Hank McKenzie came up with the, the cambering system, which was amazing. That made you turn on a sixpence. And that was just transformational. I got that, uh, uh, some sort of mocked, mocked up device, which felt a bit at half time in the first match I played it with it. But I was like a, I must have been about 30 at the time. or No, I was 35 at the time, maybe. Yeah, hang on, no, 30. And uh, it was like being given a, it was like being given a, a massive Christmas present. It did what I wanted it to do, rather than me having to thrutch around, that's a northern term, but thrutch around in my chair. And so that was a fantastic thing. Because there's also the added health benefits of these things as well. There's so much more. I mean, it, it, for, I, I don't think that there's a way to articulate just how much my life has grown over the 18 years that I've been had a spinal injury because of the invent of things like this. And But I, I do notice as well, um, the privilege that we have to, to be able to have access to wheelchairs that we're talking about, to the, the latest materials and the latest innovation. And, and so it's such, such a wonderful, exciting thing to think that the happiness for all, happiness for everybody is so all encompassing. So how do you see devices that we're talking about, like the ones that we've seen in the challenge, the finalists that we've seen, yeah. how do you see them incorporating into the cities of the future? I think that it's kind of a partnership that has to happen between uh, three parties. One is, of course, the person that's using the device. The other is the device itself. And the other is the infrastructure that's in the uh, city to make the operation that the person and the device are using together work well. The simplest example that we can think of now is wheelchair ramps, right? So ramps, of course, help with some of that stuff. But actually, as wheelchairs are developing, uh, the balance is shifting where the wheelchair is becoming more mobile and more capable of getting over the kind of terrain where actually you don't need the ramps quite as much as you did before. There's also all kinds of neat ideas about the social effects of these devices. Uh, I'm sure that both of you know that you know when you're in a wheelchair, your point of view, your eyes are lower than where they otherwise would be if you were to stand up. Mm -hmm. So now we're starting to see all kinds of different wheelchairs uh, and other devices to help raise your point of view. So you look people in uh, the eye. So that's really awesome. And the third part, and I'm sort of playing off of what uh, Sir Philip had talked about before, I think it's very important that these devices be as simple as possible also. Mm -hmm. And that we not forget that the person who's using them uses them most hours of every day for days and days and days and days. 
And most machines that we use aren't like that. Even cars are typically used only around 5% of the time. And then 95% of the time, they're actually parked. Mm -hmm. And so when you're building an assistive device, the engineering standards, the uh, level of um, skill that you need to design them well has to be very, very high. And so I think that challenges like this are fantastic because they push us on all three of those um, axes. So talking of the challenge, I'm going to ask you both, what were the things that you found the most exciting or encouraging about the five finalists that we had? Well, one thing that I really always look to is how do these devices look? Do I feel good in them when I'm using them? You know, or, or does it make me really feel like one of the uh, D fraternity, you know? And, uh, and so that's, that's very important. And, and, and looking at, I'm looking at them now, these devices, you know, you'll, fe you'll feel good when you're using them. You'll look good. You know, it'll raise your self-esteem. And, and so that's the key thing for me. It's not just... You know, some, sometimes engineers will look to a, an engineering solution which mm. does the job, but you don't feel good in them, even if they work properly. So, so that's also important. And I think when we look at what's on offer here at the, at the five finalists, then you would feel good using those devices. And I think that's very important as well. Do you think that's because of the co-creation, because people are consulting with the end user? Well, it's absolutely the case. And, uh, and uh, you know, when it always used to be a chromium tube, you know, that was used, and now you can get them in all sorts of colours. Uh, you know, you can have different coloured uh, spokes in your wheels. You can do whatever you want, basically. And, and why not? I think that every single one of them uh, actually hit it out of the park on building a device that was useful, uh, yeah. that could actually give a true augmentation to the lives of the people that were to use them. Uh, they were each different in their own way. Uh, and so it actually, as I looked at them, you know, the feeling that I had was just like, wow, these guys really got it. And I think that co-creation idea was responsible for that. It was clear that this was not uh, just a bunch of technical folks coming up with things, dreaming it out on their own of what they believed a disabled person would want. The entrepreneurialism that we've seen demonstrated in not just the five finalists, in all the entrants that have come through was so inspiring. What are your thoughts on, on kind of the entrepreneurialism and the inspiration that that might set to other people who might be thinking of ways in which they could bring, bring value and, and bring a sort of innovation into this space? To find people, as we have found here with the five finalists, that have got good products but their enthusiasm, their passion for what they're doing, this is so key, you know, to their futures and, and for them to uh, expand into being a going concern. So uh, it's wonderful that this is happening. It's something that Toyota fully backs. When you meet a true entrepreneur, you will hear stories of failure, 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 and then finally success. So um, I think the entrepreneurial spirit is exceptionally important. And I think it's through the courage of these groups uh, that are willing to fail, but when they succeed, boy, that's just amazing that we actually can make the breakthroughs that we need to make. Well, Sir Philip and Dr. Gill, thank you both so much for your time. I know we are all itching to know who the winner is. So thank you. It's time to go. <laughs>